He's got a new book out called Winning the 13 Crucial Principles for Achieving Unbeatable Performance. Smart guy, fascinating. Tim Grover, CEO of Attack Athletics, joins us live. So we were talking during the break about uh, I asked you if when you were training Michael Jordan, uh, did you train anybody else? And you gave me a funny answer. Tell our audience. Oh, Michael always said, he goes, hey, I don't pay Grover to train me. I pay him not to train anybody else. <laughs> so there's your answer. <laughs> that is so Michael. You know, it, it, it is. It, it really is. You know, the thing about Michael that's amazing, Michael, I said this during the break, Michael played hard. He hit the floor. Uh, I remember watching him play with my high school coach at the time. And he said, that's not going to last. You can't play like Michael Jordan. You can't go up against seven foot, 275 pound guys. And it's like he did last. He had one injury early in his career. Was it genetics? Was it the work ethic? I mean, how do you explain Michael? It's all of those things. But see, what I did was I studied his game. And uh, the things I trained him on was like, all right, Michael, you are falling a lot. Let's teach you how to fall correctly. Because there are there is correct ways to fall. All right, And when you do hit the paint, all right, there's areas that are more susceptible to injuries, you know, your wrists, different areas in your back and so forth. So we emphasize those areas where we knew the impact was going to be. Now, could we ever prevent and guarantee that he wasn't getting going to get injured? No, but we mimic the training the way he played. And when you do that, it really helps minimize what you're trying to do. It is interesting. I, re- I, I, I read a story one time about Michael. He could play like 72 rounds of golf in the humidity. Uh, you know, minor league baseball, he would go out and put one of those uh, like tarpy things on, those, those jackets that create and induce sweat, and sit in there in the southern sun for three hours and do batting practice. Were there ever times that you – because you trained Michael for baseball and football. Was there ever yes. a time with Michael that you said, Michael – Take a day off. Let your body heal. Yeah, you know what? It was most, we were very in tune with that. And with these great athletes, it's not about the go, go, go. A lot of times it's about the stop. It's about, hey, you've done enough. Take a break. Go relax. Go play golf. Do whatever you, go, do whatever you need to do. And they have to. So taking a break actually becomes competitive for them. So you, ha- you just can't tell them to shut it off. You just can't tell them to unwind. These are true winners. They like to be wound up. So you have to figure out a way for them to relax, but that's still competitive for them. Listen, Carmelo Anthony was in LeBron's draft class, and by 33, he was a role player. And it was pretty well documented that he was not a grinder. Uh, Big Ben has not aged as gracefully as Brady legendarily not a grinder in the offseason. Anthony right. Davis came into this year for the Lakers, and Anthony Davis was not in shape. He had to play himself into shape. And so that, that can be very dangerous because it's so fast yes. at, at the NBA level. So what, like when a Michael or a Russell Wilson, when they first day of training camp, Tim, take me there, do you want them in their best shape or do you want them to have to play about 8 to 10% into, into game shape? Colin, you said it perfectly. We don't want them at their peak condition, but we want them close enough to it where if they need to dial it up, they're ready to dial it up. So I've always had all my athletes report into tra- into training camp well into above 90% of all being ready. You're not going to use – you don't use training camp. You don't use those other things. You don't use OTAs. You don't use preseason games to get into shape. You use that – to work on your timing. You use that to work on your game. You do not use that time to get into shape. I mean, there's a lot of things. You know, I call it the championship hangover, and I've had clients that have had this hangover for 12 years now where they've won that championship and they still have that hangover about celebrating and not doing, not doing the things that are quickly as quick. Once you win that championship, you got to come back better. So in order to come back better, you have to actually take off – less less time because if you come back the same player you're not going to win that championship again you know it's um the brady thing it's it's hard to get your hands around it unbelievable it is is it pliability like for him being yoked isn't really essential do do no. like for a football player that you've trained and michael is the training different in terms of weight volume repetition 
it, it's totally different. You know, even when Michael's training for baseball was different than for basketball. And now Russell's training is completely different than what I did for what I did for Michael, what I did for Kobe, what I did for Wade and all the basketball players I work with. Different muscles, different movement patterns, different reco different recovery, different intensities, different volumes. I think it's all different. The injured, the areas that are injured more are, are a lot different. I mean, if you think about a, a football player, their maximum effort output is for what five seconds during the play. Right. Yeah, it's for about it's for about five seconds. So you have to make that adjustment in the volume of the person's training, how intense the training, how intense the training is. And, you know, in basketball, it's completely different. The, you know, the, the rest interval or the maximum output is a lot is a lot longer. There's a lot more jumping in basketball uh, and in uh, football. There's a lot more cutting. There's a lot more planting. There's a lot more head movement. So you have to adjust the training programs completely, di completely different. Now, the foundation may be the same. You, you know, you have foundation principle exercises that you want everybody to do to prevent injuries so they can have that longevity, so they can have that power up. Uh, outburst. Even Tom Brady said earlier, I, I think it was last year, a couple of years ago, that he he had to incorporate some weight, some more weight training into his uh, into his training regimen. Because as you get older, listen, the muscles do tend to atrophy a little fat, uh, a little faster. They do tend to get they do tend to get weaker. So adjustments are constantly made, not even from year to uh, year to year. It could be from game to game. So I, here's a, here's something my wife and I argue about. She went vegan mostly. She'll have fish once in a while, and I'm like, mm -hmm. honey, uh, I look around the pro athletes. There's not a lot of vegan athletes. I'm like, I'm not saying I'm going to sit around and eat steak all day, but I like I like uh, last night I had chicken fajitas. I like my chicken. I like my fish. I grew up on the beach. What, what, what do you make when you hear ah oh, vegan? Ve ve part of me, I I don't want to sound like an old guy, but I you know part <laughs> of me is like. Is it really bad to have a piece of fish? No, it's not bad at all. I mean, listen, the the uh, omega the omega threes, the omega six you get from fishes, the if uh, the anti uh, inflammatory properties that you get, the things that red meat does for you, the things that chicken does for you, like obviously. I always go, what works for the athlete? You know, you can't take what somebody else does and say, hey, because they became a vegan, it's going to, it's going to work for me. Now, as you get older, you know, there's, 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 uh, it's becomes more difficult to digest food. So there might have to be a little transition, but if a person is playing extremely well and this is their nutritional intake, go, go do it. Just go do it. Find out what works for you. Cause Winning is different for all of us. It's different for all of us. So you spent 15 years as Michael's trainer, and uh, I I've said this before. He had a fondness for Portland because Nike was based in Beaverton, so he was in Portland a lot, and I, I worked there for years. Yes. And his last game against the Blazers, he was for the Wizards, and he was the best player on the floor. <laughs> and in Portland, always loved him. I mean, he was never – it was not like Detroit or Cleveland. Portland loved Michael Jordan. They loved sure. him. They almost felt like they, he was theirs because he was in Portland all the time. <laughs> and, and I remember that last game. But take me to the time. So Michael is – there's young Michael, there's championship Michael, there's baseball Michael, there's championship Michael, then there's retiring in the Wizards. When you – the very – take me to the last year you train Michael Jordan. Were there things that you noticed like, oh, Michael can't do that anymore. Let's do this. Like, was he not as superhuman at the very end? Oh, definitely. You know, listen, uh, Michael wasn't doing all, all the crazy dunks and so forth. Could he still do some of them? Yes. Did he have the same elevation? Did he have the same first step? No, he didn't. He's just he's just not. All right, so a train. So the emphasis was more put on injury prevention. Our goal for that year was for him to play all 82 games and play at a high, at play at the highest level possible. And we did achieve that. Obviously, Michael wanted the playoffs. He wanted to keep going. It just didn't happen. But the training regimen did change. And obviously, you know, people forget he had that he had that injury with that finger with the cigar cutter. Yeah. So those all the all those things ha had to be had to be adjusted. It had to be adjusted. And the time uh, the time that was taken off between retire between retirement and when he when he was playing again. And then there was also when we were doing when he was playing in the pickup games. Uh, Colin, you've heard this story. You know, there was there was this injury in a pickup game with him and Ron Artest that set us back quite that set us quite a bit, uh, set us back quite a bit. 
Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, I see all these guys now. Tim, I swear every night somebody gets hurt in the NBA. And I think to myself, okay, maybe it's the condensed schedule. But, you know, I mean, Michael's playing every other night. And, by, you know, by the way, the old guys, they were on commercial flights up at 6 in the morning, didn't have guys like Tim Grover, ate like nonsense. And I don't remember all the injuries. Is some of this just guys make so much money now they don't want to play through any tweak and make it worse? And some of it's just I'm not going to play tonight, though I could. Well, you know what? Also, it's funny. When I played in high school and I played in college, the coach decided how much who got to play. Now it's the trainers and the statisticians <laughs> and the person's keeping and the person that's keeping the log books that decides whether a player is he is healthy or not. And yes, there is there is some science behind that. But if you tell a person he's not capable of playing or you plant something in their mind, they're going to they're going to run. They're going to run with that. There has to be some accountability with this thing and the training regimen. You can't if you are 610, your training program cannot be the same as an individual who's six, five, who's six feet. Your training programs are different. Your levers are different. The way you step is di uh, different. Your center of gravity is different. Your angles are different. Those programs have to be unique to those individuals. So if you have a seven footer who's doing the same program as your point guard, it's not going for one of those individuals. It's not going to work. Finally, let's talk about me because I'm very important here, Tim. So I'm 57 and I like an occasional cocktail. So as my trainer as my one minute trainer here, is it okay to sometimes have two or are you going to, if I was, if I, cause I work out every day, I, you know, I run three and a half miles, four days a week. I'm going to go lift weights today. I do that twice a week. How many cocktails is fine, and how many is Colin get to bed? Here's a question. Do you drink because you want to or because you have to? That's the first question. <laughs> well, I drink All because right. I'm with my wife. She's having wine, and I, I like to okay. flirt, so I like to have a All cocktail right. and flirt. So the, the maximum amount of alcohol, depending on what type of alcohol it is, is two glasses a day. Maximum. Maximum. Two glasses a day. Well, seems That's the maximum output. That's if you're if you're on a workout regimen. If you're on a workout regimen like yourself. If you're not on a workout workout regimen, it's it's one. It sounds very and then, and, then, well, and well. then drinking, you know, whether whether you're drinking wine or you're drinking tequila or you're drinking beer. They're all different. They're all different. Sounded like to me, Tim, what you said is if I work out harder, I get two is what you just told me. You, if you work out, <laughs> well, if you, if you work out consistently, if you work out consistently, I'll let you have two. <laughs> and I got that for free. <laughs> the, the book is called <laughs> winning uh, the unforgiving race to greatness. Look at that, man. I love that. All right. <laughs> You've aged well. Great seeing you again, Tim. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.